Beloved saints, God has called us for this day. What are we that God desires to find the lost souls through us? And God will not delay in this. He will work through each one of us. And therefore, God's zeal must be our zeal. And our zeal must reach God such that he will say of us, I know you love me. If you love God, then we love our brethren. What I'm saying is, yes, we must love our enemies who have a debt to pay back to us, but run away. But we must really love the lost souls. Because without loving hearts, we cannot evangelize. We say we love God. Then God says there are our brethren who God has lost. So we must preach the gospel to them, show a warm care to them. They don't know what church is. They don't know who Jesus is. They don't know how the creation work of the universe took place. Once we lead them to church, I mean, does a baby grow by himself right after he's born? His parents have to take care of them, changing diapers, take them to hospital when they get sick. And they sleep only late at night, only when the baby finally sleeps. And when my daughter or son cries in the public, the mom will carry the baby out so that baby won't be a nuisance to anyone. And she will come in and out trying to soothe the baby. And this process, parents will nurture the baby, like uh, one year, two years, three years, and five years pass by, and the baby grows and become very smart, is very intelligent. Pe the parents are so happy to see their child growing up, to become very smart and wise and lovely. You know, already from when the babies are young, people can tell how they will grow up to be. So parents can easily tell children's childhood from the way they play. Likewise, if you really love God, then you abide in His love. Why? Because God's love comes into our hearts and dwells in us as His love. Once we understand this, nothing can stop us from evangelizing. There are sons and daughters whom our Father God, Father God has lost. So whether in season or out of season, we must strive to evangelize. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 through 2 speaks to us to preach the gospel. But we just don't understand God's love. So he says, whether in season or out of season, with all your might, preach the gospel. Why did God give us this command? He has his children who are lost. They are our brethren. So if we love God, there's no way we cannot pray. We cannot evangelize. There's no way we cannot pray at night. So whether in day or night, I go and pray by Mount Gerizim or Mount Ebal or by my headquarters. I've been calling this place headquarters since the Gurudong Church. So either at the front or at the back deck, I pitch a tent and go in there to pray for an hour or two. You see, we must not be lazy in finding the lost souls. And if I tell myself I'm going to uh, stay diligent to find lost souls and fulfill my duties, then God will outpour his zeal upon our hearts. Believe that he'll pour it upon us like a waterfall. God's love has no end. Its height is endless. Its depth endless. Its breath endless. Whether we go north, east, or south, or west, we will see God's love. We will breathe his love. All the creation in the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, all things testify of God's love. And God has given that love to us, to you and I. And how thankful is this? How thankful. To this day, we have been breathing His love. We have been eating and drinking His love, experiencing His love, and holding His love all the way to this very moment. Anyone who really loves has already perfected it. 
such people have already fulfilled God's love. And the day of the judgment, they will not even have the slightest fear. They will be bold and strong, just as it's written in our main text. But we have not loved our God. So in John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, God so loved this world that he has given his only begotten son. So anyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God's first love. The love that led him to kill even his only begotten son. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 also states, How I have loved you, even to the point of killing my own son. Jesus, isn't he without sin? He's completely sinless. He's God himself. Yet God made this perfectly sinless being to bear a human form, made him into a sinner like us, and sent to us. And God imputed all the sins of humanity entirely upon his son, Jesus Christ, and told him, you must die on the cross on the hill of Calvary. And through his death on the cross, his precious blood can revive the human race by forgiving the original sin, the hereditary sins, and the self-committed sins. Man's ancestor, Adam's sin, that sin is called the original sin. Your ancestors, your grandmother, your grandfather's hereditary sins. The Bible tells us that apparent sin can go down to three to four generations. This is called the hereditary sins. Then all the sins that you yourself have committed, knowingly and unknowingly, three sins, these three sins are washed away completely clean all at once. Like when your clothes get soiled and they turn or gray or brown, you put the soiled clothes into the washer and put the detergent and, they, and they run it. And the clothes come out so clean as if it never got dirty in the first place. As if, was I ever dirty before? That is how they will all come out bright and clean. That's what Jesus did for us. You know, when we say the trees are beautiful, oh, the scenery is so beautiful. You know, that is all God's love. What we see, what we breathe, what we drink, what we eat. Please give thanks for all these. And so people will come and say, eat this, this is good for you. But you know that the Israelites, they did not understand such love of God. And that's why they complained in the wilderness, saying, we only have manna in this wilderness. But look at what God says about his manna. He says they are like multivitamin. So when they go out in the morning, this manna has rained down with the dew. It's all white. And they were like round, like this coriander seed. And they are like a pearl, a bedellium. And so they will beat it in the mortar, they will grind it into a fine flour, or sometimes they will boil it and eat it. And when they eat it, you know, they didn't have kimchi like Koreans do, or yogurt, but this manna has this, the same effect as a nutritious food, as if they have settled down already and they were farming and they planted spinach and they grew it and after picking them, they cooked them to eat it and nourish their body. See, already all of that was in manna and yet the Israelites did not know to be thankful as they ought to be. They didn't eat meat, and yet the man already had that meat in it. It had all the vegetables, all the vitamins from A to Z were all in there. And also, God told Moses to speak to the rock, right, so the water can be yielded. And, and then God says, don't strike it. So Numbers chapter 20 shows how God commanded him not to strike the rock, but to speak to it. So this river of, uh, 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 gushed forth with water. Right, uh, uh, the rock, rock gushed forth with water, and it formed a river, and then. But because the people just wouldn't understand, God said this in various different ways so that people can understand. You know, there are only a few times uh, there was this rock incident in the Bible, right? Throughout the 40 years, the rock yielded water only a few times. Only two times, right? 
But God will still give them a, a mist, like a dew, and this moisture upon the desert, so the animals or the people would have enough moisture and not be thirsty. But the Israelites did not know about all this. And also, today's technology may be very advanced. Worldwide, right? But is there shoes that will not wear out after 40 years? They only had one clothes. But their clothing never wore out. They never got soiled or got dirty. Also, they walked. They walked for 40 years. Did they have a cart or something to pull them or drive them? They were walking on the desert sand, completely a desolate place. Yet their feet did not get blisters. This is all God's grace. God's grace was upon their clothes, all the way down to the soles of their shoes. For 40 years, they did not need a thread or a needle. Their clothes did not tear. There were no holes. The shoes never wore out. They experienced miracles like this. Isn't this all from God's love? So I ask you, please love your neighbors and your brethren like you love yourself. How can he who cannot love a brethren they see with their eyes love the invisible God, this God whom they cannot see? According to this passage, such people are liars. If a man does not breathe even for a while, if he cannot breathe the air, he will die. Just the same way, if a man does not experience God's love, does not know God's love and forsake it, that the person will die. However, if he loves God, then God will abide in that person. God says, if you love me, I abide in you, and your love will be made perfect. God is love himself. So whenever I officiate weddings, I always include 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 through 8. It's about love. Man exists by eating and breathing this love of God. We must know this. You don't know whether God dwells in you. You don't believe. However, even if you don't believe, may the Holy Spirit help you understand that God dwells in you. He's always working in your heart. You must never forget this. God's love is the origin of our life and our very existence. It is, it is the origin of our life. It is the very basics and foundations of our life. You adore your grandchildren. You adore your sons and daughters. But try looking at them through God's love. For that is a very basic and foundation of life. But because you don't realize this, we neglect God's love and just say, oh, my baby, my baby. How can that be? Psalm, Isaiah, or Proverbs, they all teach us that the entire creation came from God. And God says, there is no other God beside me. I am the creator. I create the heaven and earth. And when I speak, even the heaven and earth will stop at once. They will halt. Then God says, I will never forget you. I know all your names. Because we don't understand this, God says, you know, there are many, many stars in heaven. I can call them by their name. Look at the sky. The galaxies are scattered like golden powder, right? There's so many stars. How can they be numbered, right? Billions and trillions of stars. But God saying, is telling us because he created them all, he calls them all by their names. That is why. You know, there may be uh, a population on this earth, maybe 6 billion, 7 billion people on earth, just like parents. They know their children by their names. Our God, creator of the universe, knows all of us by our names. Jeremiah said, I am too young and I cannot speak. 
So yes. God says, and, and so he says, I cannot do what you ask me to do. Then God says, I am with you. I will be in your mouth. I have known you and chosen you from the womb even before you were made and even before you were born. Is Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 a lie? Don't know who mother or father is. They didn't even marry yet, but already before the ages, before the foundation of the world, God saw Jeremiah. Just like that, God is the same to you and I. Even before it's known whether your father will be a last name Park or Kim, when you're very young, God already knew you. And he already knows if this son and that daughter marry, then so and so will be born. Our God sees all of this already. And isn't this God whom we call today our living father? So please do not forget God's love. When you adore your grandchildren, see them through God's love. Then their future will be bright. And when you strike, uh, when you stroke their heads in love, just the same way God will be pleased and proud of them also. This is the basis of our life. God's love is. How great is this? Isn't this? Isn't God's love the one and only hope for all the saints? Can it be love when it's only words? A lawyer asked Jesus uh, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. He asked, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first commandment. Secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the second commandment. And these commandments sum up, and upon them depend all the law and the prophets. Romans chapter 13 verse 8 states, when you love your brother, you fulfill the law. But you see, men cannot keep all ten commandments. Let's say one keeps nine out of ten commandments. He did not keep one. Then according to James chapter 2, according to James chapter 2, he is still in sin by breaking all the ten commandments when he does not keep just one. Therefore, those who are wise and bright, who trust and fear God, when they love God, when they love their brethren whom they can see, they are fulfillers of the law. How great is this? There is this easy way. And yet people don't want to do this. They will say, Lord, I believe you perform this penance, go through the self-mortification here and there at this church and that church, at this mountain, that mountain, and pray so hard. Do you think that will all work? All you have to do is to love your brethren. That is a way to fulfill law. Let us read Romans chapter 13, verse 8 through 10. Please don't let your love be taken away from you. Why would you let God's love be taken away from you? Let's say a husband. We can see our husbands, right? Isn't the husband the object of wife's love? But if the husband have another woman, listen carefully, he's, he's love that used to come to you 100%. No, because he is another woman, not even half of that love comes to you. Then would you be stupid and just sit there and watch it? Wouldn't you grab his tie and throw this great fit and say, let's die together and go crazy and attack his face with the feline claws and, right? Don't let nothing take the love from you. Why should you let it be taken away? Love is the most precious treasure to believers. It is number one treasure. Even if your house is filled with earthly gold and silver, without love, all of them will be just blown away. But if there is love, all of them will be well preserved. That is why when someone is rich, if it's a worldly wealth, it can be all blown away at any time. But the wealth of a saint will never be blown away. Please know this. So you see, you should never be foolish to forget love or let anything take the love from you. As I said earlier, if there's, there's none who keeps all the law, if you keep nine and break one, then all that you have kept will mean nothing. It is as if you have violated all of them. But if you love your brethren, 
you have fulfilled all the law. Romans chapter 13 verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves is his neighbor has fulfilled the law. There's nothing except to love. He who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. This is the word of God. How easy is this? Right? God's commandment is to love others. God's word is to see others as worthy human beings. All the people profess to believe in God, they may be a pastor, elder, deacons, they raise their voice at church. But if they don't love others, those people do not know God. So when we look at others, we look at them through God's love. When we see them through God's love, how can we not love them? So we are able to love them, saying, God loves that person, what am I to hate him? I shall love him too. See, all the law, all the word is about seeking a love, about loving a person, loving the person's soul, loving the body of that person, loving God's will to fulfill it on this earth. That's how it is fulfilled. First, uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Ready? Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is a fulfillment of the law. See, love does not do any harm to the neighbors. Love is, fulfills the law. How great is this? So whether in the Old Testament or New Testament, the word of God is about one thing about seeking a person, loving a person. There's nothing more than love to it. I pray that you'll become a spiritual bathhouse, bring all the people who are dirty, wash them clean, bathe them clean, so they will come out with this lovely fragrance. Just like that, may the entire Pangonjo church become a spiritual bathhouse for the name of the Lord. If you didn't come out this morning, how would you, would you be able to listen to message? Let's go somewhere. What are you going to do? Love never harm others. Love never causes loss in other people. Love is all about sacrifice. And then when we were able to grow up this much because of our father and because of our mother and there are sacrifices that is unseen. Love has no calculation. When the dad gives a son money, would he say, hey, bring me a, a, a book, notebook. And the father writes down, what year, what month, what day, what hour, what minute, I gave you $50, okay? He writes down. No, love does not have any calculation. Love forgets. Even if there's a, a flaws or sins in the children, even the entire neighborhood is against your children, you will embrace because he's your son, because he's your daughter. The love covers all flaws. Love covers all flaws. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14. Let all that you do be done in love. All that you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, let it be done in love. They are the number one people in the kingdom of God. The number one people. One may systematically memorize the Bible, and have lots and lots of knowledge. So all people look up to such people. But if that person does not have love, I'm sorry to say he's not even worth a dog dong. Those who really believe in God serve their church well. And really strive to understand the word and to understand they pray, they praise, they come to church anticipating the grace and the word. You know, these people are true treasures. Even though they may have been dung in the past, even dung will become a great treasure. There will be nothing to throw away from such a person from head to toe. And God says, I'm going to make you such a treasured people of mine, and you will not have any smell. Second Corinthians chapter 2 talks about 
you know, there are people who give out a stench of death, and also there are people who give out fragrance like perfume. Please listen carefully. This is a very important message. First John chapter 4 verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. See, God himself is love. In our main text, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 tells us that God is love himself. Whether you look at him from the front, from the back, you look at him from upside down, our God is love himself. So precious. Only God is the origin of love. Only God is root of all love. Only God is a living spring of love, where a, a spring that gushes forth with the water of love. That is why nothing will work out when we walk away from God. God spoke to prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 5. You see there is people without God and verse 7 talks about people with God. Their thoughts are already different. And people with God will be like those who planted by a river, never experienced drought. Their leaves are always green. They are always bear fruit in its due season. What blessing is that? That's why we cannot live away from God. David also professed and said that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Everything about his life is all fresh and green. It will never be a dried, withered. It will never be like that, like a dead corpse, right? Rather, the life will always be evergreen. It's always fresh, always vibrant, always living. That is love of God. We must make sure to experience this, right? God's love is, God is the origin of love. God is root of all love. You see, God is like the birthplace of love. He is a true address where the love is. You have your address, your current address, your birthplace address. So you are born in Gyeongsang province, but you live in Seoul. We must believe in God like that. How wonderful is this? Love is God's attribute. It's God's nature. And it is a true origin. God is a true origin. God is the love itself. That's why we observe Christmas on December 25th to celebrate how God loved us first. Our main text tells us that because of our sins, God sent his only begotten son to redeem us from our sins. God sent him as a lamb of atonement. How precious is this? And that love dwells with sinners. When Jesus, when God sent Jesus on this earth, we see in Matthew chapter 1 verse 28, 3, Emmanuel means God is with us. And yet people do not understand that God is with us. So in order to allow the mankind to hear, to allow mankind to see how God is with them, how God's love is with them, God sent his love to us through this Emmanuel God. We have witnessed this through the Bible, through the word. So beloved saints, as I said earlier, what is the greatest commandment? First is to love God. Second is to love our neighbors. It's so very accurate. We see in Matthew 22, verse 34 through 40. So thankful. You can ask nothing more. Very tired. I went to bed really late last night. And this morning, got up early to prepare the sermon. And now I have to pray. Whatever, no matter what people say, would I not pray for all the people who came to Yeoju, whether they're adult or young, for all your souls, I pray before God, please hold them tight, God. May you breathe into their bodies this breath of God's love. You know, like a balloon, when you breathe in the air, the balloon gets rounder and rounder, and you can see the air goes in, right? Just like that, I pray that may God breathe in his love into their hearts. 
How can I not pray for this? Until we go to the kingdom of God, we must embrace God's love. And while we live on this earth, we must see God's love, we must eat God's love, we must drink God's love, we must breathe God's love. May all the families live in the love of God. How can I not pray for this? I must always pray. I can't. I cannot go on without praying because my conscience will be pricked if I don't pray. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 27, or Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 34. Colossians chapter 3 verse 14 Beyond all these things put on love which is the perfect bond of unity so above all things whatever how no it doesn't matter how great it may be you must put on love above all things no matter how beautiful a lady may be maybe how graceful how awesome looking how well dressed the person may be like a belt if you don't have a belt you know even your underwear you, there's even rubber band to make sure it's like it's snug, it's snug at your waist right so you know when you have a belt when you wear your pants it will not go down because of the belt the belt holds everything together you see the love is like the belt that binds together the Bible tells us you must gird your loins, right? Like a belt, a belt around your waist. So in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. So you cannot see the flaws anymore. They are invisible. When you are filled with love, you cannot see anybody's flaws. Now, King David actually killed this Hittite. Um, he's a husband of this woman that he touched. So the prophet Nathan spoke in parable. Now, prophet Nathan did not know what actually happened. But God gave him revelation, saying that, you know, this uh, king of this nation did this. And so Nathan heard this and went to David and said this. So David was shocked and said, Oh, what brought you here? And the Nathan says, I came to meet you. And so what happened? Oh, there's something very great happened. Okay, please tell me. And so Nathan talks about this parable. Say, there is this poor man, and he um, raises his son and daughter. And it's like, and he, they are dear to them like the sheep, right? Now this wealthy man has lots of sheep, lots of slaves, right? But this rich man steals a, a lamb from this poor man. And so David got really infuriated, saying, what kind of man is this in this kingdom? No such man should be in this kingdom. And then prophet Nathan responded, it is you. See, King David did everything in secret, but God was watching everything with his fiery eyes. And he informed everything to Prophet Nathan. And so Prophet Nathan says, the sword will not leave your house. And there is, will be a great bloodshed among your brethren. You know, this is a very terrifying word of judgment. And so, G and so David says, I'm a sinner. I've committed sin. And ever since he confessed this, as we see in Psalm chapter 6, verse 6, he cried so much, repented so much to the point that his entire couch, his bed, will be drenched in tears. Look at this. Isn't this love of God? God poured his love upon King David so that David could understand and realize. He could realize this. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 Leviticus chapter 19 verse 13 Proverbs chapter 3 verse 27 through 28 Colossians chapter 3 verse 12 through 15 First Timothy chapter 1 through 5 1st John chapter 4 verse 7 through 11 1st Peter chapter 1 verse 21 you cannot read everything because of time restrictions Greek now the Old Testament is written in Hebrew but the New Testament is written in Greek now Greek has a four different words for love Four different words for love. Please listen carefully. Four types of love. First is Dorge. It is a love in family, a love for their own people. The second is Filio. Filio. It is a friendship or affections, a friendships. Third is Eros. It is a love between opposite genders, a love between men and women. Two people will come together, do all kinds of crazy things, and they will never know to be ashamed, right? Nothing will embarrass them. Even the fire truck can not put out the fire between the two, right? Fourth is agape love. Now this, only God can do. You know, even if my son were a crippled child, you will not be able to kill your child for the sake of your town, right? Even if he's not well, you always have this compassion upon the child. And whenever you look at the child, your heart just breaks into pieces, right? Even a child who is not well, you feel this way. But you see, God's agape love, you know, when there is a great bombing, a, a bomb explodes, right? the body, you cannot see this body in one piece. The, the lo for body form is lost completely, right? The neck is falling over there. The arm and the leg is all scattered all over. And the flesh is like stuck on the wall. That is kind of sacrifice that son of our God has gone through. This is such a sacrificial love that God showed to the point of killing his own son in that way. Only God can do this. To the very end, we keep saying, I don't want to believe in Jesus. But God will follow you to the end. He will come next to you and say, when are you going to be mature? When are you going to repent for all your sins? Your heart is filled with evil like Simeon, seeing Simon, right? But in order to drive out all the evil from us, God will not give up and come and follow us to the very end. Whether it's raining, whether it's snowing, whether it's cold, whether it's hot, He will follow us to the very end. This is agape love. He will take all means for your sake. But the, he could fry up his son in, in the fry pan or kill him in, in all the, the gru most gruesome ways possible. But God says, I don't care. If you be saved by my son dying, then I will not ask for anything more. So although we don't believe in Jesus, we keep rejecting Jesus, although we curse at Jesus, God will still stand out the door and knock on the door for you, just as Revelation chapter 3 says. Please open, open. If you just open the door, I will dine with you and you will dine with me. This is agape love. You see, storge, phileo, eros, all these loves are selfish love. It's for their own sake. But agape love is all about giving. It's all about me dying to love. It is all about sacrifice. Jesus came and he said, I have not come to be served, but to serve by giving my life as ransom for many. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. What a precious word this is. This love is not partial. It does not change depending on somebody's mood. 
This love will drive you crazy. You'll become a mad person because you'll keep giving more and giving more and more. You'll keep on giving. God is out of his mind because when he pours out his love, it's endless. And that is a love that you and I are receiving right now. So how wonderful is this? 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a love of song. It's a praise of song. It's a psalm of song, a psalm of love, a praise of love. Love is like putting in the kingdom of heaven right here. There is only love in the kingdom of God. So if you go to the kingdom of God, they will all feed you. They will all be feeding one another. When you go to hell, they, everybody has a spoon, but they cannot eat because their arms cannot be bent. You can only feed yourself when your arms bend, right? Because when they were on the earth, they only wanted to feed themselves. So when they go to hell, right? So they do have a spoon in their hand, but because their arms do not bend, they are not able to feed themselves. But in the kingdom of God, they all feed one another. They will feed one another. They are just a big gob of love. That is a kingdom of heaven. So I pray that you will seize this opportunity. You know, when um, there is like a gold mine, right? We, we say that's like a gold mine where when, they, when you find a gold vein, right? It will have endless supply of gold. So you come here only one day, right? But I pray you will discover this gold mine of love, that you will witness this love. You will all dig out this true diamond of love. So until you go to the kingdom of God, you will eat love, drink love. You will stay in this crucible of love. May your love become a main food, a staple food for your life. So as you live on in love, May you become a treasurer of our love, of God. Let us all raise our hand. The Old and New Testament is epitome of love. So God, no matter how lofty a mountain may be, it cannot reach the height of your love. No matter how broad and vast the five seas and six continents may be. It cannot be as wide as your love. And you have given that love to us to the point of dying. Let us be thankful to you. No matter, even, even if nobody will tell us to evangelize, nobody will tell us to come to church, let us do all things freely, voluntarily. Why? Because it is love of God that compels us. A people at Corinth we're told that love of God is compelling them. We have no choice because we are compelled by the love of God. Help us to taste this love to the very end. Let us become the crucible of love.